Hello, my name is Kirk McKenzie. I'm concerned about the direction that our country and our world are going in. And after more than 20 years and recent events, I am more concerned than ever. Accordingly, I have decided to be silent no more and through a sequence of YouTube videos to share the information I have learned. I hope you find these to be informative and helpful. Thank you. Today's topic is how to take our country back. We are beset by issues. And unfortunately, we bounce around from one to the one to the next with no resolution. In a similar fashion to the arcade game Whack-A-Mole. They never disappear. In fact, they only get worse. And we the people become frustrated by this endless activity. Another more constructive way to look at the issues is in a chronological order. The issues that have come and gone and the issues that are currently being fought. In this fashion we can see that a tower of power has been constructed and it's been constructed in a sequence for a reason. The lower levels are the building blocks for the upper levels. Whether it's called progressivism, socialism, communism, globalism, or new world order does not matter. They all want in the same thing. Our response as a people has been to fight the issues of the day. It is inherently a defensive fight. And by thrashing, we become worn out, and fatigued, and discouraged. You can't score on the defense. The second part of our response has been to concede those issues that have already come and gone. Instead, we need to go on the offense, and we need to make it count. Money is the foundation of this Tower of Power. In 1773, Amschelmeyer of Ostrald lays down the proposition of rural control through central banking. Give me control of a nation's money, and I care not who makes the laws. His son, Nathan Rothschild, takes control of the Bank of England the day after the Battle of Waterloo. I care not what puppet is placed on the throne of England to rule the empire. The man that controls Britain's money supply controls the British Empire, and I control the money supply. We can see how this unfolds in the history of the United States. The first effort to form a central bank is in 1782. It's given a 20-year charter. At that time, corporations were not perpetual. They were formed for only for a public good and only for a specific purpose. Hence the 20-year charter. The founder, Robert Morris, was imprisoned in 1798 for all the fraud and abuse, and the charter expired in 1802. The second effort was led by none other than the first Treasury Secretary of the United States, Alexander Hamilton. He gets Congress to agree to chartering the first bank of the United States for 20 years. In 1811, they go for renewal, and it's defeated by a single tiebreaker vote of George Clinton of New York. What follows is the War of 1812, a war with apparently no purpose, but in fact perhaps it's retaliation by the bankers to force the United States back into a situation where it doesn't have sufficient tax revenues, it needs money to fight this war, it needs to revert to central banking. If that was its purpose, it succeeded. In 1816, Congress charters what's now become known as the Second Bank of the United States for 20 years. In 1832, President Nicholas Biddle, president of the bank, seeks renewal and meets the strong will of President Andrew Jackson, who vetoes renewal. And what follows is Biddle declares an economic war on the United States in order to force Jackson to change his mind. In addition, in 1835, we have the first assassination attempt on a sitting U.S. president. Andrew Jackson survives the attempt, and he prevails. The charter expires in 1836. In 1848, Karl Marx issues the famous Communist Manifesto and lays down ten points, a ten-point strategy, of which the fifth picks up on the Rothschild scheme, centralization of credit in monopolistic central bank. He concludes, the theory of communists may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. What 
follows is a civil war. After 70 years of running with a constitutional currency, gold and silver coin, Abraham Lincoln breaches faith to the Constitution and faced with either borrowing gold and silver from Rothschild and the New York banks at 30 to 40 percent interest, he decides to print paper money. In 1861, those are demand notes, 1862 with legal tender notes, and we have a response from London that year in the form of a Hardzard circular, which will be discussed in a moment. In 1863, the banks win. After 81 years, they now have the power to issue privately issued banknotes. The National Banking Act is given a charter of 20 years. In 1864, Lincoln speaks out against the money power. I see in the near future a crisis approaching. It unnerves me and causes me to tremble for the safety of my country. The money power preys upon the nation in times of peace and conspires against it in times of adversity. It is more despotic than a monarchy, more insolent than autocracy, more selfish than bureaucracy. It denounces as public enemies all who question its method or throw light upon its crimes. I have two great enemies, the Southern Army in front of me and the financial institutions at the rear. The latter is my greatest foe. Corporations have been enthroned and an era of corruption in high places will follow, and the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until the wealth is aggregated in the hands of a few and the republic is destroyed. It is clear that Abraham Lincoln, in getting his paper currency, understood he had done with the deal, a deal with the devil and fully intended to reverse things around. He's assassinated five months later on November 11th, 1864. The National Bank Act is set to expire in 1882. In 1881, the sitting president is James Garfield. He is against renewal. He's assassinated that year, and Vice President Andrew Johnson becomes president and agrees to renew the bank for another 20 years, starting what's called the Second Charter Period. That charter is set to expire in 1902. In 1901, the president is William McKinley, also against the renewal. Following his assassination in 1901, Vice President Teddy Roosevelt, himself a member of a New York banking family and the first progressive to get into office, takes office as president and he approves the third charter period for 20 years. That charter expired in 1922. During this period, however, what follows is an interesting election in 1912. That year, William Howard Taft is president. He is removed. He loses the election. And how is this accomplished? He is a Republican and a popular incumbent during a period of relative prosperity. His challenger is Woodrow Wilson, a relatively unknown, austere, in fact, wooden professor. His main Qualification for the job is he believes the country would be better off run by men like J.P. Morgan. How does he win? And the answer is Teddy Roosevelt. Recall that he was a Republican president. Nonetheless, he runs as an independent, as part of the Bull Moose Party, a party that exists for this election and this election alone. He splits the conservative vote, Taft is defeated, and Woodrow Wilson comes into office. On December 23rd, 1913, two days before Christmas, he signs the Federal Reserve Act into law. It had taken 131 years, five different attempts, undoubtedly a lot of labor and effort, but the central bankers have finally won. They now had their central bank and a perpetual charter. Our nation was fundamentally changed. We see that by that point, the foundation and the control over money had been established. It's worth then understanding the currencies that we've had at the federal level. Beginning with the U.S. Constitution, no state shall emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. Article 1, Section 2. 
this specifically says no bank notes. In other words, no Federal Reserve notes. It was a bedrock principle, and that is because of the unique characteristics of gold and silver. They have intrinsic value. George Washington, first president. Paper money has had the effect in your state that it will ever have to ruin commerce, oppress the honest, and open the door to every species of fraud and injustice. Second president, John Adams. Banks have done more injury to the religion, morality, tranquility, prosperity, and even wealth of the nation than they can have done or ever will do good. All the perplexities, confusion, and distress in America arise not from defects in the Constitution or Confederation, nor from want of honor or virtue, so much as downright ignorance of the nature of coin, credit, and circulation. And finally, Thomas Jefferson, the third president. I sincerely believe, he says, that banking institutions are more dangerous than standing armies, and that the principle of spending money to be paid by posterity is but swindling futurity on a large scale. If we, American people, ever allow monopoly banking to control the issue of currency, first by inflation and then by deflation, these banks and bureaucracies that will grow up around them will deprive we, the people, of all our property until our children will wake up homeless on the continent which God gave us for our stewardship. The Civil War, as I already discussed, brings us into the era of paper money. 1861 demand notes, 1862 legal tender notes, followed by gold and silver certificates. We see again the relationship between paper money, central banking, and war. War, as it turns out, is extremely profitable for the bankers. They get both nations in their debt, and they get their paper currencies. Well, let's take a look at the government debt to give you some scale. The national debt increased by 41 times during the Civil War. To put that in perspective, this would be equivalent to Barack Obama's term in office, the national debt going to say roughly $11 trillion to approximately $500 trillion in four years. The issuance of paper currency reduced the value of the currency some 55%. For all the bad they may have been, there is a good thing about this particular kind of paper money. Although it has no intrinsic value, value, it is redeemable. And there's a guarantor, the United States Treasury. It's printed by the government, the Bureau of Engraving to be specific, but more importantly, it's issued into circulation by the government. It does this simply by printing the money and paying its troops and other employees and its expenses using this money. This allows the federal government to operate without borrowing its debt and interest free. Which leads us to the Hazard Circular. Circulated in London in July of 1862 and the corollary article that appears in the London Times. Quote, if that mischievous financial policy which had its origin in the North American Republic should become indurated down to a fixture, then that government will furnish its own money without cost. It will pay off its debts and be without a debt. It will become prosperous beyond precedent in the history of the civilized governments of the world. The brains and wealth of all countries will go to North America. That government must be destroyed, or it will destroy every monarchy on the globe. London and the Bank of England had declared war on legal tender notes. They succeeded. In 1863, the National Bank Act authorized the private issuance of bank notes, the National Bank Act. Federal Reserve notes are nothing more than a modern version of the bank notes authorized by that act. The bankers gained the ability to put money into circulation. Unlike the other monies that we have referred to, there's a difference here. Eventually, the Federal Reserve notes become not only worthless paper, but there is no redemption in anything, no gold, no silver, no guarantee, and no guarantor. They're still printed by the Bureau of Engraving, but they are given at the cost of printing to the Federal Reserve and then borrowed back by the federal government in a process known as debt monetization. The banks will not put money into circulation unless somebody borrows it. Now, 
the history of the financial legislation is, fan, is absolutely fan, uh, fascinating and worth studying. The net effect of this is all government issued currency is eliminated with the exception of the coins that we carry in our pockets. Which makes it important to understand the nature of debt monetization. As the wealth of a nation grows, and by the real wealth we're referring to land and buildings and schools and parks, the money supply must grow. But in a monopolistic debt monetized system, the only way to get more money into circulation is for somebody or some government agency or some corporation to borrow it. And it does not matter who borrows it, all these debts ultimately are paid for and borne by the people. A second corollary of this system is that it is impossible to pay down the debt without imploding the money supply. By paying off debt, the money disappears from circulation. It is axiomatic. We are electing people to Congress who are claiming to go to Washington, D.C. and start restoring financial uh, sanity to our policies, but they do not understand that they cannot accomplish their goal unless they challenge the monetary system itself. Now, if there were an implosion, the real wealth remains. The land, the buildings, the schools, the parks, they're still there. What becomes shadow double is who owns it. During financial distress, the wealthy get wealthier and the people get poorer. A second corollary of our money system is inflation. Here we have again the real wealth of a nation. We have the current supply of money, the volume of money in circulation, and therefore the value of the dollar and the prices. If the money supply grows and is used to build real wealth, then the value of the dollar remains stable. If, however, the money supply grows faster than real wealth, the value of the currency declines. And because it does, prices go up in a process that we know as inflation. Now most people think of inflation as an increase in prices, but this only describes the symptom, not the cause. A better way for people to understand inflation is that it is an increase in the money supply, which then devalues the currency, and because the currency is worth less, prices go up. A gallon of milk or a gallon of gasoline does not appreciate in value. It has constant real value. It is the value of the currency that declines. When banks make loans, they increase the money supply without any government involvement. Typically, when the money supply goes up, we talk about the government printing the money. In fact, the money is being created by the banks, the Federal Reserve Bank System. For example, when a person borrows money for a mortgage, they generally think they're borrowing somebody else's deposits. This simply is not true. When a person then signs a mortgage, mortgage coming from the French, mort meaning death and gage meaning pledge, when they essentially agree to become an indentured servant of the bank for a 30 year period of time, and they agree to assign effective title of the home to the bank through a deed of trust, then and only then the bank issues them a worthless currency saying here's your money created from thin air. The only value in that exchange is the labor of the person and the value of the home that's being pledged, not the currency that's being created. How this impacts you? We'll take a look at how this affects you directly. As the money supply goes up, the value of the dollar comes down, and the real value of your income, your lifetime savings, and your investments decline. Although on paper they might appear to be increasing, in terms of real value, they're declining, and taxes go up. We'll take a look at the actual numbers from the founding of our country in 1791 until 2009. As indicated by the yellow line, the value of a dollar has declined from one dollar to an actual real value of a dollar of 1.83 cents as of 2009. As of 2010, it's even lower a 55 times decline in the value of our currency. Events that are pivotal, the War of 1812, Coinage Act of 1834 makes gold more valuable and therefore reduces the value of the silver dollar, the Civil War of 1862 which drops the value of the paper by 55 percent, it eventually recovers, and then 1933 FDR signs Executive Order 6102 
ordering the confiscation of all gold and gold certificates from the people at the threat of imprisonment and large fines. The gold and certificates are not turned over to the Treasury. They are turned over to the Federal Reserve Bank corporations. They are privately owned corporations, not government agencies. They are no more federal than Federal Express. So in effect, the people are forced to give up their constitutional money in exchange for Federal Reserve notes. Once they have been given the paper, the paper is devalued by 40%. In effect, in one year, the bankers take 40% of the wealth of the nation. Then, in 1971, Nixon takes us off the gold standard and the dollar plummets. I personally don't believe that Nixon was an evil man. It was simply all of the dynamics that had already been put into place. Gold was flowing out of this country and he had no choice. If we take a look at a more current period of time from 2000 to 2009, let's assess what's happened to your income. Here we assume a $100,000 income and a 5% raise per year as indicated in the yellow line. You see an increase in the value of your income. But during this period of time, the dollar has declined in terms of gold. The gold constant dollar has dropped to 27.3 cents. So the income that you see, which has increased to $155,000, in fact, in purchasing real value, has dropped. And has dropped to $43,000. Next, let's suppose you have a savings you had a quarter million dollars, you were conservative, you put it into a fund that got 3%, and you saw a steady increase in the value, or so you thought, to $334,000. But because of the decline in the value of the currency, you've actually lost, and your, net, your savings is actually worth only $91,000. Then let's consider a combination. You have savings, you take 10% of your annual income, and you put it into your savings, they grow to $448,000 or so it looks. In reality, after all of this effort, your savings is $127,774 in real value. In other words, roughly half of what you started. We see in all three cases the destruction of your wealth. Next, Let's consider what happens to your investments. On November 2nd, 2007, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was 13595 By October 15th, 2009, it had declined 26%. But taking into account the decline of the currency itself, it in fact had declined by 44%. Had you been one of the unfortunate people who either had to liquidate to get cash or you were scared by the declining market and sold, you saw a huge reduction in the value of your savings and your investments. And in real terms, you lost 58%. That went to somebody else. The press and the television talk about the Dow Jones recovering to its prior levels. But in fact, because of the devaluation of the currency, the Dow would actually have to increase to approximately 50,000 to be able to recover its prior value. Uh, your home has gone up in value, and you've been building yourself a nest egg for your retirement. Well, in 1950, that home was, say, $30,000 and has increased to a million five for an appreciation of a million four hundred and seventy thousand a year, or so you think. But the red line indicates the value of your home measured in gold, in other words, a constant dollar. And in a constant dollars, the home was only increased to 49528 and that almost entirely due to an increase in the population in the area. In other words, increased demand. The remainder is entirely due to dollar devaluation or inflation. It is not a real increase in wealth. So policy set by the Fed and the federal government to inflate the currency, not only rob you of your income and your savings and your investments, they have the audacity to come back and then tell you that this gain, alleged gain, is taxable income, when in fact is nothing more than inflation.
1913 we had the Federal Reserve Act, but there are other things happening around that period of time. In fact, earlier that year, on February 3rd, the 16th Amendment was allegedly ratified by Secretary of State Philander Knox, for whom Fort Knox was later named. This allegedly creates the, the authority for the federal government to impose a federal income tax. Well, why do they have to have this amendment? And the answer is that in 19, 1895, on April 8th, the Supreme Court ruled in a decision called Pollock versus Farmers that the federal government did not have the authority to impose a federal income tax, arguing that the tax, to, the power to tax, is the power to destroy. Subsequent to the 16th Amendment, it was challenged, and in February 21st, 1916, the Supreme Court again rules in Stanton versus Baltic that the 16th Amendment creates no new powers of taxation. So if the federal government didn't have it to start, and this didn't give it to them, it gives the meaning to the question, do we have a voluntary or a mandatory federal income tax? This becomes the second aspect of the tower power. These two form the twin towers. Central banking is a process that creates, increases, and perpetuates debt. And central taxation is the police power that government can use to force the people to pay these taxes and the interest back to the bankers. On April 8th, the 17th Amendment is allegedly ratified. As envisioned by our founding fathers, the people would be represented by the elected representatives in the House of Representatives, who would have control over the initiation of all legislation and the budget. However, the states would be directly represented in the Senate. The senators would be designated by the legislatures. They would effectively be ambassadors, and they would have direct ability to veto things that they didn't like coming out of the House of Representatives. Therefore, the states had, an, had a role to play directly in the federal government, and therefore the federal government was somewhat subordinate to them. The 17th Amendment changed this. Now the senators would be popularly elected the states were dealt out. That becomes a third major point. When we consider these three together, we can see what happens. As envisioned by the Founding Fathers, the people would be at the top. They would be citizens of their sovereign states, and these states then would have a direct hand in controlling the federal government. The people would pay their taxes with gold and silver, the states who would then pass off this interest and debt free currency to the federal government. Via these changes in 1913, the Federal Reserve effectively replaces the states. And now we have, instead of a, a uniform tax, we have a progressive tax. When you make a tax, a federal income tax payment, it does not go to the Treasury Department. Just look at the council check and look at the bank routing number and you discover it goes to the privately owned Federal Reserve banks who take this income from you and then credit it against the debts owed by the federal government through the debt monetization process. As a consequence, a group of international banking families or globalist bankers are supreme. They have control over the federal government and in turn the people are reduced to the bottom. Other things that occur in around the same period of time that are fundamental. New York City primarily begins to take control of the mass media. Newspapers, news wires. All television now emanates from New York City. 95% of magazine publications, books, including school books, come from there, and so on. Public education, which is a plank of the Communist Manifesto, we begin to see its real nature. It removes parents from the education process as well as the local community and substitutes indoctrination instead of education and become increasingly centralized in the federal government. And finally, in New York City, the formation of the United Nations, initially called the League of Nations. These are the foundation upon which all the remaining things have been built. Our objectives as a people going forward to take our country back are as follows. We must go on the offense and we must go for the foundation. If we can get the foundation, the rest will topple. 
and nothing is more important than to end the Fed. If we do everything else, but we do not take away the power of creating money from these people, everything else will return. The only way we can win permanent liberty is to return to a sound currency as envisioned by our founding fathers. We need to challenge the 16th Amendment. We need to reverse the 17th Amendment and get the state's representation back in the Senate. And we will see that all these unfunded mandates and dictates coming from Washington will come to a quick end. We need to end New York's control of the communications. We need to shut down the Department of Education and return to local education, and we need to defund the United Nations. While these are our core objectives, we have to defend ourselves against other things that are currently attacking us. We must defend our right to keep and bear arms. We must defend the sovereignty of our country against the formation of a North American Union or the exchange conversion of our currency to an Amero or some kind of an international monetary system and we must defend against illegal immigration. Repeal Obamacare, stop cap and trade, and stop Agenda 21. In fact, all of the issues that are attacking private property. In effect, we draw a line in the sand, no more. To begin the restoration, we must begin to build our own core competencies. And that foundation must be built on truth. You will not get it on television. Turn off the TV. Begin reading books. Begin listening to other people who have studied these issues. They may be expressing opinions different from what you understand, but listen to them carefully because they may actually understand what is true. Second, the experts need to help to get the word out, and they can do this by putting together books and YouTube videos and newsletters and articles and flyers that get the word out. Next, everybody needs to be part of a communication system. We need the ability to get this information out to tens of millions of people. And we do that largely through the internet and using how to utilize those tools. The organizations, the grassroots organizations like the Tea Party, the 912, the Campaign for Liberty, the Second Amendment, all these groups need to begin to form alliances with each other. Ultimately, we all share the same purpose, the restoration of a constitutional government. They don't have to give up their individualism, but they do need to communicate, coordinate, and cooperate in a way they have not yet done. Finally, all of these will then affect public understanding and the public opinion. And as a consequence, we will then hopefully elect people that have the understanding, the courage, and the conviction to be true refounders and get us back to a constitutional um, government. How you can make a difference. And you must be part of the solution because a few people alone cannot do this. First, help spread the word about this video that you're watching. Although the video you see in my example is a different video, you'll see the same screen when you get done playing the one that you're currently watching. Hit the share button. When that comes up, you'll see the URL. Go ahead and copy that link and put it into your emails and put it on your Facebook accounts, put it on your uh, blogs. Get it out to as many people as you possibly can, your groups, and have them watch the video. Second, if you are a web designer, click the embed button and you'll see the code right here comes up. You just copy and paste that into your website and people can now watch this video directly from your website without ever having to go to YouTube. The next features require you to have a YouTube account. If you don't have one, click the button to get a, create an account. If you do, go ahead and sign in. First, give my video a thumbs up. By increasing its score, it will increase its visibility to more people. Second, add it to your favorites list. Third, subscribe. By subscribing to my channel, you'll be notified of any new videos that I come up with. Fourth, if you feel so inclined, go ahead and leave a comment in the box below the, the video. The favorable comments are extremely important because they help to convince other people to watch. To learn more, just go ahead and visit my YouTube page called Silent No More Pubs. Just click that and it will take you to there directly and you're going to find a wealth of videos on a wide range of topics that are under my playlists. 
Next, make sure that you watch my other video, Why We Are In So Much Debt. It'll give you more detail and a basic, clear, simple understanding of the mechanics by which your wealth is being destroyed through the monetary system. This can be done by typing in the search term and clicking the search button. If you're inclined, if you're one of the 3% to read books, there's no better book to start with than the one that I have written, Money, Defending Your Prosperity, the second edition. This is an excellent introduction to the topic. It's available from my website, www.silentnomorepublications.com. If you're inclined to do so, here are some other recommendations. Written in 1882 is the book Financial Catechism and History of the Financial Legislation of the United States from 1862 to 1882. It details the legislation being enacted by the North during the first charter period. Next, a book first published in 1899 that has been resurrected called The Coming Battle gives an excellent history of the financial legislation throughout the 1800s. The Secrets of the Federal Reserve, first published by Eustace Mullins in 1952, is the first to disclose the secret nature by which the Federal Reserve was created and who was behind it. And finally, The Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin is a seminal work on the topic that came out in 1994. Next, make sure that you watch both of my videos, the one that you're currently watching and the one Why We Are in So Much Debt. And then here are some other recommendations. Freedom to Fascism, featuring Aaron Rousseau. Rockefeller reveals 9-11 fraud to Aaron Rousseau. It's full of information about the power structure behind the monetary system. Creature from Jekyll Island, featuring Edward Griffin. And Founding of the Federal Reserve by Murray and Rothbard. All of those videos can be found simply by going to my YouTube channel at www.youtube.com slash user slash silent no more pubs if you prefer to listen you can listen to some radio interviews I've had with Brian Lee at KYNO Randall Turner at Money America Ernest Hancock with Liberty News Radio and Dr. Stan Monteith at Radio Liberty in an increasing number all of which are again available from my website This video is dedicated to the memory of Aaron Rousseau. Now, since the Federal Reserve has come into being in 1913, illegally, without a constitutional amendment, by bribing a few senators during Christmas vacation, they turned over the most important power that the American government has, the crea creation and issuance of money, to a private bank. Through that private bank issuing money, they have destroyed this country. They have destroyed the purchasing power of the money in this country, They've created social programs that are destroying this country. They, they have a machine that can make all the money. It's not about money. It's about control. It's about their vision of how they want to see the world. What we want doesn't matter anymore. It's their agenda. It's their plans that matter. So uh, the ultimate goal that these people have in mind is the goal to um, create a one-world government run by the banking industry, where everybody has an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be um, in those chips, right? There'll be no more cash. And this is giving me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. And all money will be in your chips. And so, any, so not, instead of having cash, anytime you have money in your, in, your, in your chip, they can take out whatever they want to take out whenever they want to. And you become a slave. You become a serf to these people. That's their goal. That's their intentions. How they control the media, they control the government, and they're all in bed together. So we, we, you're fighting all this propaganda all the time, and it's a very difficult fight. If we ever want to win this battle, you must shut down the Federal Reserve System, and we must shut down these bankers. Look, we're dealing with complete evil. We're dealing with complete evil. And until the American people wake up, and say, we don't want the evil in our country anymore, and we want to come back to a country of decency and goodness and integrity and honor. You know, we're, we're going down that road. But just, folks, you know, all I can say is, you know, take our country back. Restore the Constitution. Don't let these bankers do this to us anymore. Stand up. Don't be afraid of them. And uh, do what you got to do. 
to be. It takes all Americans to stand together, to stand tall, to mobilize and say, we're not going to take this anymore. I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. We're going to stand up and, and, and fight the battle. And you and I can't do this alone. We're just leaders of the thing. But other people have to join in with us and stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and say, I'm not going to take it anymore. That's what it's going to take to win this effort. I sincerely thank you for taking the time to watch this video and hope that you get others to do the same. The more people that become awakened on this issue, the more likely the return of our liberties and our financial prosperity. If you feel so inclined, feel free to drop me an email at author at silentnomorepublications.com. Thank you.